We got Gary Michael Capetta here. Gary, how you doing today? Hey, I'm doing okay. How you doing, Brian? How you doing, Dave? Hey. We're doing really good, Gary. We just, uh, I just actually finished reading your book, uh, this morning. Uh, -huh. uh Body Slam Memoirs of a Wrestling Pitch Man. It's about, uh, 21 years of working in the wrestling industry from being, uh, the guy that this, some of the older fans will remember, uh, very young Gary Michael Capetta being chased around the ring by George the Animal Steel until actually being the first, uh, what, probably the first six figure, uh, ring announcer. Maybe the only one in the history of pro wrestling. Would that be correct? Um, I think, well, definitely for, uh, definitely as the person who only was doing ring announcing, I think that's true. Having only, or only professional wrestling ring announcing. I mean, obviously Michael Buffer made a great living doing ring announcing for boxing, and he did do wrestling at yeah, the same time. He was not working in the office also. You know, right, right. With the guys, like, for instance, Howard, I don't know what he does, uh, but he doesn't just ring announce. He works full-time in uh, Titan Towers. Right. So as just a an announcer, I think you might be right. Um, let's see. Um, I would think right now. Yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. Well, I don't know what Penzer does, but um, well, he's 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 booking uh, worldwide, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> he's putting he's all the good job. <laughs> he puts all the good matches that, on TV that nobody ever sees. Dave, you know, Dave was um, Dave was very loyal to WCW in the years before he started announcing. Supplied a lot of job guys when they used job guys, and uh, when it was decided that I wasn't going to continue, they treated him so shabbily. Um, and I actually tried to coach him, you know, tried to help when I saw I wasn't coming back. Um, Dave was, um, you know, he wanted it so bad, and I and I understood it, and he kind of had to take what uh, they gave him. And I hope that he's, you know, he's worked out a. A better deal. I mean, they actually brought him in, and they said, "Look, Gary Capetta is not going to continue, but we don't want you to get the misconception that this is a promotion for you." You know, I mean, right away, <laughs> the control deal, and then the first um, pay-per-view after I left, which was June of 1995, Dayton, Ohio. Michael Buffer couldn't be there, and uh, my contract had, had expired. We had agreed to part terms, and they called me. And they wanted me to continue. And I said, what do you need me to continue for? You have you know, Dave Penzer and you have Michael Buffer. Well, Michael can't be there. Well, okay, you have to show any kind of faith in Dave Penzer. And uh, I didn't do the show. And Dave did the whole thing. He did a fine job. And, you know, more credit to him. I just thought it was a shabby way to treat him. One of the, I think that one of the strengths of the book, and one of the things I liked about the book is, is I saw you in this book as sort of, the normal guy in the, let's see, how about the, the, the normal guy in the unnormal world, if that's such a word, mm -hmm. of professional wrestling. And, it, and, and it, sometimes, you know, you, you, you were in it, but then you weren't so in it that you were, like, in the quicksand aspect of it. And the fact that you were able to walk away from it in itself says something because, you know, basically most people, you know, that, that leave professional wrestling are, are dragged out kicking and screaming. Yeah, um, because it's, you know, once you get the bug, you know, you never you never want to leave. these call the, the Hotel California. Mm -hmm. Um and you know you you understood I you know what what I almost wish that you would talk more about especially being in WCW for uh what 1988 through 1995 or most of that period not not quite but but during that whole period from just before the thing kind of took off until I mean or before it took off and that whole period where Turner owned it and it was a, a series of false starts is that whole um What's the word I'm looking for? Political, you know, and you touch on the, the politics and everything, and then maybe you should, you know, discuss the whole thing of, you know, you're sitting there. One of the things as a fan of, of wrestling at that time is the thought that, you know, WCW should be killing Vince McMahon because it's, you know, CNN and CBS and Ted Turner and everything, and yet somehow, you know, it never got its act together, and then, like, we would watch CNN, and, and they would feature, like, WWF guys on TV, and, they would, and, and, like, they would never have WCW guys on, and the whole thing was, well, we don't want to show favoritism to our own company, and it was, like, that that whole frustration that you know here you are owned by a company that actually could be the number one company in wrestling, yet they didn't. It's like they didn't want to do it, and you were just running around on the road spinning your wheels. It was what do you think that was? The resources that Turner Broadcasting had, um, that you know they they just wouldn't allow to uh, to WCW. Actually, it's funny you say that because the, the working title of of the book. Um, I wrote this book back in 95, 96. When I came off the road, I spent two years solid. I, just, I sat home and I wrote. Um, and the working title was um, 
body slams in the boardroom. Um, and I just had so much material. I mean, I have another I have another half of a book that's on my computer that is not part of this body slams edition um, because I just couldn't fit everything in, and I just thought it would be more entertaining and informative to uh, to the fans and also to the non wrestling fans who want to learn about the business to just step back a little bit. And part of it reads like a, a reporting a reporter's view. The other part is like fiction um, of, of the road stories and except the they're, they're all true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's very hard in wrestling. I mean, you know, the, the, um, it, it's, it's so much in, in, in vogue to say, yeah, we're doing a shoot interview. Very rarely is there a shoot interview on television. Come <laughs> on, please. And, but what's in Body Slam? Except, except by Shane Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> what's in Body Slam? And on ECW television. television. <laughs> yeah. So, um... I mean, and no one has has shot any holes in any anything that I that I report. Um, it, one thing that's unfortunate, I think, is that it's it always seems to be more you know tantalizing, titillating, um, fascinating for people to talk about the negative side of things. And uh, I, I try to, and I believe I've presented a very well balanced look at at my experiences with different people. Um, for instance, Dusty Rhodes in my book. Uh, I, don't, I don't paint him in any negative light because whatever he did and however he did the NWA in and however huge his ego may be, it didn't affect me. And this is my perspective. So um, people may have something to say about, uh, negative to say about the personal side of some of the announcers, but they were always very generous to me, always gave me name plugs, always gave me, uh, Jim Cornette called me the world's most dangerous announcer. Those, those sound like little things, but they're important. Um, now let's go to the ring, Gary Michael Capetta. That's important. And, and the reason I believe politically that they felt comfortable doing that is that I knew what my role was and I was very happy with it. And I had no aspirations to be a commentator. And the only time I was a commentator was when I did it in the Spanish language. And since Jim Ross and Tony Schiavone and Chris Cruz and you know all the other guys weren't capable of doing that, there was, there was no threat to them. So they were always very generous to me, and I always appreciate that. I totally screwed up in that Legion of Doom uh, Money Incorporated thing because Legion of Doom lost the title of Money Incorporated in early 92, and the WrestleMania I was talking about was in 93. So that wasn't the reason they won the belts. Okay? So totally screwed up on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, that's the Maybe deal there. Maybe stuck there for a year. <laughs> in England. <laughs> <laughs> it was August when uh, it was. I think it was DiBiase and um, I think it was IRS against the Legion of Doom at that SummerSlam at Wembley. I know it was at Wembley because it was because uh, he never came back from Wembley for a long time. Him and him and John Nord. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Also, one more thing I just want to make mention since somebody asked about this one. Um, they were arguing. There's an argument about Jeff Jarrett when he left the WF to go to WCW with Russo last year. Did he hold Vince McMahon up for additional money to appear on the pay-per-view and do the job for China? He held the Intercontinental title, and yes, he did. If so, do you know what the amount was? I heard it was into the six digits. Is that true? Um, I believe the number was somewhere between 175 and 200 thousand dollars. So yes, it's true. And actually, he held up Jim Ross. So he got his little revenge on Jim Ross because he blamed Jim Ross for. Uh, him going to WCW or something. Anyway, Gary. Hey, Jim's never going to cook for him. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, in the, in the uh, five years since you left pro wrestling, yep. um, back to almost every five-year period of pro wrestling, there were monumental changes, but probably more in this five-year period than anyone except for maybe like 83 to 88, there were, the whole business changed you know, because of the death of the territories and McMahon going national and, mm -hmm. and Turner ended up getting involved at the end of 88. But this one as well, I mean, it was just... Uh, the whole atmosphere of the business changed. And looking from the outside as someone who was on the inside for the, the previous pretty much 20 years, what, what are your thoughts as far as, um, you know, viewing how, you know, wrestling from kind of a, a distance, but kind of, you know, I'm sure you're still friends with a lot of the people in there. Yep. Um, here's my fear, Dave. Um, wrestling is always, as you know, has always been a cyclical business. In 1985, when, uh, when Hogan and, and McMahon took wrestling nationally, and uh, you know, Cindy Lauper and the MTV and NBC Saturday Night, people couldn't see that there would be a, a, a downward spiral. spiral. Um, then came the early 90s and Vince's trial, and, and of course Turner wasn't doing anything to capitalize on, uh, on Vince's misfortune. They, they couldn't see how 
things are like through the roof and people can't see the, what's going to happen. And that is when the next fad comes along and, and the fickle public, you know, not the hardcore fans, but the fickle public goes in another direction uh, to whatever, whatever it is that we can't foresee right now, I'm concerned of what the condition of the business is going to be. Um, how is the business going to be left? Um, I'm not thrilled with a lot of what I've seen, and I know you've heard that over and over again. But I have a, a business reason for it, um, because there's only so much, that, there's only so far that TNA is going to go. There's only so far that the vulgarities are going to go, and the blasphemy, and all that kind of garbage. And uh, I, I don't, I think it's 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 great short term if if it's going to sell tickets. But what's going to happen in five years, four years, six years? when that is around again and it goes into the toilet. What's going to be left? And I think that the one way that wrestling has always um, remained healthy is when the core product keeps with the art of the game. And I talk about the art of the game in Body Slams. Um, it's, the art of the game is not um, hitting someone in the head with a, a, a staple gun or shoving someone through a table. It's not violence. It's simulated violence. It's magic. It's magical. And when you take the magic away and the wonderment away, you've lost the heart of the art of the game. And unless that's preserved, it's going to be very, very tough to revive the business the next time the cycle goes into the downward spiral. Now, one of the things you talked about, actually, this was... Um Oh, only in passing in your book, you mentioned this, and I remember vaguely this, the, the, the situation when it happened, mm -hmm. uh, was when you filed a suit against the WWF, mm -hmm. um, and you actually, you actually you know, what, did you get a settlement, or did you actually win in court? How did that thing end up? Oh, boy. <laughs> dangerous <laughs> waters, but let's, let's, let's go into some dangerous waters. Okay. Um, back in, uh, let, me, uh, let me just, I have to set it up, back in 1979 or so, when uh, people were just starting to buy VCRs for their home. And we really couldn't foresee, um, you know, the Zoom, you know, that the fact that everyone's going to have a VCR like they have a, a, a telephone in their house or a television in their house. Um, Vince McMahon sent out to a, a local spot show in northern New Jersey release forms. And it did, in, in exchange for, it was either a penny or a dollar, but I think it was a penny, all the boys were to sign these forms. Once you sign the forms... That's, that's, that's fair compensation, a penny. <laughs> <laughs> Once you sign these forms, all of your rights were gone for any kind of merchandising. And, uh, of course, I was a little quiet announcer in the corner with the funny bow, bow, bow tie that no one paid attention to. And I just thought, man, this doesn't sound right and I don't like it. So I just took, took the form, put it in my pocket, and I never signed it. But everyone else who's on all of those early Coliseum videotapes sign those rights away and um, if they got paid they got paid just because Vince wanted to pay them but not because Vinny had to pay them and um, so when those I, I didn't know about the, the Coliseum videotapes I was busy I was teaching I was announcing I was I was uh, working in other areas and uh, actually were students of mine that came up to me in class and said uh, Senor so I teach Spanish they call me Senor Senor I, we saw you on the, on the videotapes so what, what are you talking about what videotapes and as it turned out, I was on 11 videotapes, including Hulkamania. They even lifted my voice, and I'm um, the voice on the audio tape of the Hulkamania workout set from the, from the mid-'80s. Um, so I sued the Titan. I sued WWF. Um, my attorney was, um, Dave, I know that you're going to say, Gary, I didn't think you were this stupid. But my attorney was a friend of a wrestler, okay? And uh, so we, we proceeded. He filed the, the papers, and uh, things were going along nicely. And then all of a sudden, magically, and I still don't know why, my attorney stopped representing me, but didn't help me. He stopped going to the pretrial hearings. <laughs> the case, Dave, was... In, in, in a case against Vincent McMahon, how does this happen? <laughs> you know, like I, the case was um, dismissed in February of that particular year. In June, I received a letter after several telephone calls to my attorney saying, Gar, everything takes time. You know, just, just be patient. Now, mind you, the case had been dismissed. <laughs> and I have this letter in my hand from my attorney. I didn't find out until the following October when I had other attorneys look into it for me. So I sued my attorney. 
and uh, because the case against Mr. Um, it didn't even stop there. Uh, so I, I, I sued my attorney. It was a malpractice suit. In order to win a malpractice suit, you have to prove the underlying case, which I did, which was that Vince McMahon owed me, um, and that it was a, a valuable case. Uh, we had a uh, we had a witness, which was our, our star witness, to show the value of videotapes. And a couple weeks before the trial, all of a sudden he remembered that he had had an association with the WWF. So he was gone. So it was, you know, make, the, make conclusions for yourself. I'm just telling you those are the facts. Um, I did win the settlement against my attorney who, um, who was disbarred in New York as a result. Wow. And that's the story. That's Jeez. those are the facts, okay? Wow, that's... What happens when you make a deal with the devil? What was that, Brian? <laughs> what happens when you make a deal with the devil? Well, there you go. Well, yeah. There have been many, many diabolical deals along the way that I've, you know, been privy to, but... No. So, yep. yeah, I, so I, I didn't get into it in Body Slams. I have a, another half of the book already written that I had to pull out. And um, if and when Body Slams is picked up by uh, um, uh, a, a larger, it will be Body Slams Plus. Now, many people, um, certainly like in the Philadelphia area, New Jersey area, will remember you uh, from the 70s and and uh, what was it all-star wrestling was it that the, the hamburg show i mean i remember like when i was first when the first time i became familiar with the world wrestling federation or worldwide wrestling federation yep. uh it was you were you would be the ring announcer on one of the shows and and joe McHugh on the other right and then as time went on i, I guess basically you know and it's all detailed in the book um you kind of had a split with the world wrestling federation and then you wound up largely through gary juster as the the voice of wcw until uh, until you eventually left in '95, and one of the things, and in fact, this was actually somewhat of a—you didn't really go into it that much. Uh, it's sort of mentioned. I, I mean, you, you got your digs in a, a little bit at, 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 as far as that went. I remember one of the controversies that did involve you would have been when I guess it was Bischoff first brought in Michael Buffer, mm -hmm. because the whole thing was is that you know Gary Capetta was a more than competent ring announcer. And they were bringing in Michael Buffer, who, when he first started ring announcing um, wrestling, was totally incompetent for wrestling. Even though obviously he's a great boxing ring announcer, and even even to this day, he he comes off as a guy who's you know flown in and, and is reading cards and really, you know, has no idea what he's actually talking about. Um, but 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 he's you know he's got that celebrated look, and he can say, "Let's get ready to rumble," which I make it suit for just saying maybe. Oh, uh -oh. <laughs> hey, those are dangerous waters, there, buddy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, but at, I mean, from from your from your standpoint, did you just take it as well? You know, this is business, or it's sort of, or or like, because I remember watching those main events in that period, um, and cringing at the ring announcing and going like, God, I mean, they got a ring announcer. I mean, whoever heard of two ring announcers for a show anyway? Let, let, let me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Before I answer your question, that uh, you just um, as you just went through a little bit of a history where I went from WWF to Gary Jester, I think and and. and Tell me if I'm wrong about this. I think that I hold the distinction of being the only individual to ever work for the AWA, the NWA, and the WWF at the same time. Possibly. At the same time? At the same time? At the same time. I used to have... I, I wonder, I, maybe some refs that work New Jersey, is there a possibility that some of the refs might have done that? I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Because I was the announcer Certainly no one in the USA at the Meadowlands, at the Continental, Arena, uh, uh, Continental Airlines Arena. Uh, like let's say the first the first weekend of the month, and two weekends later I would be in there for the WWF. Now that that actually to me was pretty fascinating that either side would allow that. Yeah. Considering 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 you know I mean that was that was a heated war. I mean I remember that. I know. And I mean I you know I mean I remember you as a ring announcer, but the idea that you were doing I remember you did pro wrestling USA, but I I was. I was actually surprised to read, although I guess I should have been aware of it at the time, that you were doing both groups. I mean, the idea that you would have been doing AWA and Crockett at the same time wasn't unusual at all because they weren't at war, theoretically. I was but, actually they were aligned. Yeah, but WWF was, at, you know, at that point was at war with everyone, and everyone was at war with WWF. I was amazed. I was amazed that, you know, that Vinny didn't call and, you know, just can me there. But uh, it was my decision because, you know what, I... Um, I was always a second banana, always a supporting player, and I was always happy about it. Never sold a ticket, and uh, I don't want anyone ever to think that, because, well, you know, GMC wrote a book that he's full of himself, because then it's just not the case. But, but I, 
um, when McMahon didn't call me to fire me, it was like very weird, but I thought that one of the only assets that I had at the time, other than my exposure on television, was people believed me. Any, like when I was truthful to the, with them, and also when I showed the, the company's BS to them. They, they kind of believe me, you know, and, and to go out every other week and to say, this is the greatest show, you know, in wrestling, and I, and I was doing it every other week for different promotions, I, I just felt myself I had to withdraw from, from one of those promotions. And the reason I withdrew from the WWF was because uh, Greg Gagne offered me the ESPN slot, you know, so it was a national thing for me. Um, so anyway, to answer your question about the buffer thing, um, I, I outlined in Body Slams how, uh, how that all came about. How I, they actually called me into the office. Um, Eric Bischoff called me in. I sat in uh, with uh, Gary Jester in his office. Eric came in. Um, Eric said to me, there's going to be a lot of changes. There's going to be a lot of changes here. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to be going out that door. But I want you to know, Gary, you're safe. You're not one of them. Oh, okay, all right. That, that's nice. But, and I also want you to know, for this one show, as a special, we're going to bring Michael Buffer in, and we're going to ask him to do the main event. And I don't want you to be offended. And I, <laughs> and I said, okay, Eric, you know, whatever you want. Like, you're the boss. And, and uh, at that point, the, uh, as, I, as I outlined in the book, uh, Jester's phone rings, the inner office kind of uh, thing. He gets up. He leaves, and no sooner than Jester leaves the office, Eric leans over to me and says, and if there's anyone who's got to wash his butt, he didn't use that word, but his butt, it's him. This is, the guy, this is one of the guys that worked, that worked for him. You know, one of the guys that was, I don't know, I thought was being loyal to him at the time. And I'm saying, wow, you know, you, Eric, you just told me everything I need to know about you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, Eric always had the bad habit of only telling me half the story. Um, Dave, you probably uh, can confirm or, 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 or put the nicks on this, but I'm pretty sure that Michael Buffer is represented by the same guy who's done a lot of representing of Hulk Hogan. Is that I, I believe that's right. Henry, yeah, I believe whatever. so. Henry Holmes. Yeah, Henry Holmes. So, you know, it's Eric's love for Hollywood, both Hogan and Hollywood the city, Buffer in. You know, just to ingratiate himself with some power people. One of the things in the book um, that I wanted to ask you about, um, it's actually detailed in there, was I don't know if it's your first meeting with Shane McMahon, but it's certainly a meeting uh, when Shane McMahon was kind of hanging around ringside. Yep. And I, I just thought that was like a, a pretty funny story. Why, why don't you kind of recount that one? Sure. It was actually it was my one and only um, meeting with Shane McMahon, and it was when he was a teenager. He was a kid, and uh, Vinny very rarely came out to shows other than TV and um, and Madison Square Garden, but when uh, he started to groom Hogan for uh, the championship and and the national takeover, he was coming out more and more to be sure that Han that Hogan was handled properly. And he was at the Meadowlands one night, and he brought along his kid, who um, very early, you know, as far as um, uh, when he owned the, the Cape Cod Coliseum, he had Shane out there uh, picking up garbage, you know, and after concerts and so forth, and teaching him from the ground up. And uh, I didn't know he was Vinny's son. Uh, he was just a kid that was sitting at ringside at the table at the time. It was a commission-run um, event. And um, so he was sitting there, and he was getting in the way. Okay, he was, he was just getting in the way. You know, this particular card, there were, there were a lot of guys who were you know, outside the ring, wrestling all around, dumping the table over. And, and, and I would, you know, jump out of the way and sell all the time. And that's uh, 21 years of selling. And this kid was just in the way. And I, I, I thought, well, maybe he's the son of one of the commissioners, so I better be careful. And um, So we're sitting there, and all of a sudden he starts asking me questions. And his questions started getting more and more detailed and more and more business-like. And I'm thinking, wow, like this kid must have been like 16 years old. And, um, and all of a sudden he offered to me, he said, you know who I am? And I said, uh, I said um, uh, Shane, I'm uh, Vince McMahon's son. Oh, I said, well, now my, my wheels start turning, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is pretty cool. I have to, you know, ask this kid some kind of question so I can get inside of his brain a little bit. And I said to him, um, you know, I'm sure that wrestling's talked about a lot around your kitchen table. And, you know, you hear your dad talk about, uh, you know, and your granddad. Um, what would be the one thing that you've learned about pro wrestling that you think would be the most important thing? And the kid, without skipping a beat, turned to me and, and shot out, he said, to 
um, he said the most important thing is to not let your talent know, not let the wrestlers know that they're important to you, so you can get away with paying them at least the least amount of money as possible. Like, Whoa! <laughs> this is a 16-year-old kid, and it was that, that, that was my my one run-in with Shane, and I was. Uh, luckily, I was able to continue the card because I was speechless outside the ring. <laughs> it was uh, it was a very telling thing, you know. I, I've I've spoken to people who are uh, contemporaries of Shane today. I understand he's a really nice guy, but at at that particular point, uh, I think that speaks volumes, you know. Yeah, people need to remember the McMahon's um, wrestling's in their blood. They're like circus people, you know. They're um, they they're consummate business people, and they know exactly what they're doing. And Vince is. Um, for as as much as I knock him in the book personally, because he's just not the kind of guy I'd go bowling with on a Friday night, Dave. Okay, but you know you have to have respect for him business-wise. I don't like the way he treats people. I think you can be a very successful businessman and you can still be decent and and you can recognize a person's loyalty. And I think the shortcoming that he has, and people may say no, is that he's a very insecure guy and. He has to overcompensate for his insecurity in the bravado, you know. And, and the, the way he used to um, strut around uh, the old arenas, UTV, and his in his terry cloth slippers, and you know, it, it was just a, amazing. You know, he was daddy's daddy's boy, and he wasn't going anywhere. And he was only 29 at the time when I started working with him. And he was a commentator, and he sat 10 feet away from me every third Tuesday when I did the ring announcing. And uh, any time, not by my doing, but any time I got involved in the action when like George Steele attacked me or Super uh, Superfly Snook attacked me, man, he hated that. He hated that so much. But you know, that's that's you know just uh, the way he is. But he's a very insecure guy. Let's go to Adam in Brooklyn. Adam, you're first up with Gary. Oh, hey guys, how you doing? We're doing uh, really good. I first of all I have to say uh, I think Gary Michael Capetta is one of the uh, best ring announcers of at least my time. And he's one of the people I really remember from when I was a kid watching at WCW. And um, first of all, I have a question a little bit off topic. I was wondering if the deal with the WWF and WCW goes through, who do you think the first person um, that WWF would let go, as far as wrestlers go, would be from WCW? Uh, if that question was for me, Dave, I didn't hear it. Um, if, if, if WWF, if Vince McMahon buys WCW, who would be the first guy he would let go? Um, like to the other side, or just let go? No, just fire. You know, like fire? Yeah, fire. Yeah, maybe Luger. Maybe. Um, how about the know. other two guys? <laughs> um, I I don't have a clue. I'm I'm not current with the with the talent situation right now. Uh, well, personally, I think they get rid of Sean Stasiak. Russo. Well, he said he said wrestler. I would have said Russo too, except uh, he said wrestler. But you think they would get rid of Stasiak if? Uh, the ref came in because of the shenanigans backstage. It's possible. Um, maybe even, maybe even likely. Uh, you know, they haven't even evaluated the talent, so it's really hard. We're all like, you know, who knows what Vince McMahon thinks? Who knows what Shane McMahon, Jim Ross think? I mean, I'm just like surmising just because of the way the Luger left and the fact that he's not that valuable in wrestling anymore. You know, leads to me to believe that maybe you know that would be Vince McMahon's revenge is to get rid of him. Whereas Stasiak, you know, he he got fired, but. You know, I mean, he's not a big deal one way or the other. I mean, like, they could fire him and nobody would notice. They could keep him and nobody would notice. If he's on the other you know, he had heat with so many of the guys in WWF, but in WCW he doesn't have that heat with the guys. So I don't know that they would necessarily. I mean, they, 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 may, they may very well. I don't know. You know, Dave, uh, as I'm thinking about it, I think the best business move would be to get rid of his uh, public relations time bombs that are walking around there. Someone like a Scotty Steiner. Um, I that, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. I. I wonder what he would do. That's a. That's a real interesting one. Was there ever an incident when Scott Steiner left the WWF between him and Vince? I don't recall. I don't know. Was, was there? What? Someone told me there was. There may have been. I don't. I don't recall. You know, Scott Steiner's got a hot head. I. I remember the Steiners being suspended, but it was actually Rick who was suspended, and and, and Scott was suspended because Rick was suspended. Um, and that was over. Uh, I think that was over a steroid test, actually. My my guess is that that Vince is, would. I mean, if he saw the potential to make money with somebody, he would put he would put the personal problems aside, and he would just think business. And uh, since he has Viacom to uh, to please, 
and he certainly doesn't need any uh, black mark on his public record. Is that a smart thing to do to get rid of all the the time bombs that are that are stuck in there? You, you know who I can see get, him getting rid of is uh, Sid Vicious. Mm -hmm. I think Sid Vicious is already gone. <laughs> well, he's no, he's still under contract because he was just doing PR work for them just recently. They just never use him. Yeah, they just don't use him. They could probably release him very easily then because, you know. It's been over 90 days since he wrestled, days, so. Yeah. yeah, same reason they got rid of Bret Hart. So, yeah. I mean, they could, without a doubt. I mean, they, they, they could do it, so. Um, and I have a question for Gary. I was wondering what it's like to work for uh, Bill Watts, and what, you, what were your thoughts on him? I heard did, the first part. Uh, which, what was did, it like to work did you, I don't. I don't know if Gary ever worked. Gary, did you ever work for Bill Watts? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Kip Fry left. WCW. That's right. Oh, I'm sorry. I, kept, I was thinking Mid-South Wrestling. Of course, for that six, for that one-year period. Of course you did. That's yeah. right. Um, Bill Watts. Bill Watts I tried. and I got along really well. Um, and the reason for it is is that he liked he liked my work, first off. And um, when, you know, like, like other guys, when Kip Fry took over for those, what was it, Dave, three, four months? Um, yeah, four months. Yep. I... Uh, I, walked, I made an appointment with Kip Fry, went to his office, and I said, uh, Kip, you know, my contract's up. We need to start talking here. And uh, we had agreed on the this, on this six-figure deal. And But before he left, it was never signed. And uh, uh -oh. I was in the office one day. It was in June, so it was like a few months later. And I was essentially working without a contract. I was working on the old money, on the old money deal. And I said to Bill, I said, you know, Bill, uh, we really need to sit down and, 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 and consummate this deal. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you know, I'm working without a contract. He said, you're kidding. I said, no. He said, well, come on into my office. I said, all right. And, of course, Dave, I have the contract in my back pocket. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the working contract, you know, that we were working on. And they obviously had a lot more important things to do, you know, in those months. But he didn't realize that. It, so I sat across the desk from him, and he takes out his little granite glasses, and he puts them on, and he's taking a look at the contract. And he sees the number. What's that? <laughs> he sees the number. <laughs> no, but Dave, let me tell you. He said to me, well, okay, I, what's the problem? I said, well, there are, there are certain. I said, the money is right, that that's not the problem. But there's certain um, clauses in here that just aren't correct. He said, well, tell me what they are. So I start telling him, and he's having difficulty finding it. I get up walk around the back of his, his, his desk, and I lean over him, you know? He's in his huge executive chair, and I lean over him. I said, look, this is wrong. This is supposed to... And everything I said was, I mean, honestly, it was true. But it was all to my favor. And, but, but I'll tell you what, Dave, everything that I told him, he initialed. He changed it, and he initialed it. Changed it, initialed it, sent it to, uh, to uh, Turner Legal, and it was passed through. So, I mean, how can I complain about the guy? <laughs> there was also an incident. Do you remember when uh, um, Jake the Snake came into WCW? We were doing a sure. TV in Baltimore, and it was the night that uh, Sting was supposed to challenge Vader for the title. And um, the, the deal was with that Jake came in early in the night. He, uh, he attacked Sting. Sting couldn't challenge Vader for the title, so they had the, the lottery drawing. And uh, I was I was told, okay, Gary, we're going to go to the ring, but we have to announce to the people they're not going to see the main event. And Bill Watts is standing there, and he said, um, he said, okay, he said, I'll go out, I'll make the announcement. And and I'm thinking to myself, now he's going to become an on-air representative of WCW. The last thing he wants is heat with the fans. So I said, I, I, I clued him in on this. I said, you know, Bill, I, I, if I may, can I, can I say something? And he said, sure. And I always would ask that question, Dave. I, I would never just throw my two cents in. I knew how to play the game. And he said, sure, what? I said, you go out there and you start your reign as, you, you know, as, as he had just taken over a few months before. You start your reign as, as the on-air authority of WCW and people start booing you. You know, no one's going to believe you or listen to you again. I said, why don't you let me go out and take the heat? And, you know, he liked that, and, I, and that's what I did. And uh, ultimately, they, they just told me, okay, Gary, we're going to put all the guys' names in the bag. And they legitimately had all the, all the guys' names in the bag. And they said to me, no matter whose name, name comes out, it's Ron Simmons. It's going to be Ron Simmons. <laughs> and if you watch that tape closely, uh, and it was, you know, the way they did things, it was like this crumpled up brown bag that they used. You know, Vince would have had this sparkling box, you know, that was lit. and you know, He'd had those balls like they have like at, uh, in some, like, uh, you know, game Rumble. show or something. Exactly. You know? exactly. Yeah, like, the Royal Rumble, like the Royal Rumble drawing thing, sure. And if you watch that tape closely, he had said to me, 
as soon as you pull the name, you announce Ron Simmons. I don't care what it says, and you put that you put that name right back in that bag. And I just looked at him. I said, "Okay." And he could tell by the way I said, "Oh, okay," but, but I didn't understand what he was talking about. And he said to me, "Because if you put that in your pocket, or if you carry that out of the ring, and you drop it." And someone picks it up, <laughs> you know, then people will know that this is it fake. So, it's fake. If you watch that tape, Dave, as I, had, I still had the, I was in the middle of my announcement, and I still had whose ever name it was in my hand. He looks at me, and he, his head goes up and down like, put it back in the back. And it was, you know, and so, of course, I did. And that's the night that Ron Simmons won the title. Funny Anything else, Adam? Um, me? Yeah, I just want to say, I know Bill Watts gets a lot of flack for, you know, a lot of the things he did while he was there. But actually, I, you know, looking back, I was very young when it was on, but watching my tapes and everything, I thought Bill Watts had a very uh, entertaining product as far as, like, work rate goes. I don't know about you guys. What do you think? Well, he demanded he demanded everyone work hard. I mean, the, the problem with, with Bill Watts... <laughs> The, the the numbers were not that good under Bill Watts, and then the other the other aspect was is that um, he couldn't re he couldn't relate to the wrestlers at all. It was one of those things where it was like an older coach who'd been out of the game for many many years and then came back, and he wanted to re you know and all these guys were veterans and they had learned under you know Bill you know Bill Watts was totally different than everyone else who was running a wrestling company, and then he came back trying to implement his things and the guys couldn't handle it and. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you know he wanted to you know he wanted to take wrestling back to the past, like the banning the top rope move and, and banning moves off the top rope, and some of that stuff that just didn't didn't fly with the fans. And he um, pulled up the mats too, didn't he? He, he pulled the mats off of the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He didn't want any mats on the floor because he wanted when guys fell out of the ring, he wanted people to know that they were really going to get hurt on that on that concrete floor. Dave, you know, he didn't want story with the, with the, the dynamic dudes and Shane Douglas when they went uh, out to the uh, when they went out to. Uh, they, they were involved in a match, and, and Shane was supposed to choose. And then they were supposed to go out and do an interview afterwards. Remember that? I, I don't think I remember the story. I, I mean, I mean okay, so years ago. Shane was supposed to go out. He was supposed to juice. Uh, he comes back, and they're ready to send him out for an interview. And Bill Watts looks at him, and he, this guy, he's just not bleeding enough with Bill Watts. And Bill Watts hauls off, and he whack, whacks him. He <laughs> I can believe that. Right in the forehead. And he looks at him, and he says, okay, that's pretty good. Go out and do your interview. Yeah, I, I very you know hardcore. But I, personally, I didn't have any problem with him. He didn't whack me in the head. <laughs> you know, one of the things when you were talking about your court case, mm -hmm. um, you, you're aware of uh, in uh, Vince McMahon when he was on trial right. that, as it turned out, um, the star witness in the trial uh, against Vince McMahon was Emily Feinberg, who was Vince McMahon's longtime secretary, mm -hmm. and. Um, before the trial, she was approached by someone uh, to be her agent to represent her for a movie on Vince McMahon or you know book potential book deals, things like that, right? Mm -hmm. Right. As it turns out, the guy who was negotiating to be her agent happened to be the secret. Nobody knew this. I mean, it was like kept secret from from like they like had a secret wedding. <laughs> yeah. Was the was the husband yes. of the Defense attorney for Laura Vincent Mann, right? Laura Brevetti's husband, yeah, and and whose brother, by the way, um, was the in the movie The Insider. Um, what's the guy's name? Berg, Ron Bergman, I think is. What is it? Not Ron. What's Berg, the Bergman in The Insider? Al, do you know who that is? But anyway, the guy in The Insider, it's actually his brother was the one at, who would be, who would have been uh, married to Laura Brevetti and was involved in that case. It was it's, it's a fascinating story. And when you're talking about like how all of a sudden you know. This person had an involvement with the WWF. It's just, um, it was just amazing how those things happened. Yeah, you know, I had gotten a call from the chief investigator during that time, and um, I called my attorney. You know, because I, I really was unfamiliar with how, the workings of a federal prosecution, and uh, you know, I, ans I answered all of his questions truthfully and to the point. And um, he, I just, he just wasn't very um, for all of the investigating that they did. He just didn't know which questions to ask, and uh, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Okay, you can leave it there. Yeah, because you know, Dave, come on. <laughs> I, you know, it just, it, 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 I answered all those questions, and there were other, I mean, there were, I was at in the WWF during the Sohorian years, you know, and I watched the boys line up um, for uh, the dispensing of, of drugs and, and, uh, and, you know, the scripts, and, even as, I mean, I was very naive for a long, long time. And even as a naive 
guy in my 20s, um, I knew that prescription drugs, like when, when, when a doctor prescribes a drug, it's, it's, it's on file. I mean, it, it, there's, a, there's a database of it. And I'm watching, you know, this guy from uh, Maine and the other guy from Texas, and they're all lined up. And they're going to go home, and they're, <laughs> they're going to get these things filled all over the country. Well, yeah, it wasn't too bright on the, on the part of Zahari, and, and it was all because he wanted to be one of the boys. No, he, he was one of the people. You know, there's, the, but they, you know, they had doctors in every city, or, or um, there are doctors in every city that want to be friends with the boys. I mean, Zahorian was just. I mean, the thing with Zahorian was is that he was so. Um, his name became so well known in wrestling. You know, where some of the other ones, you know, just a few guys know, and they'll clue in a few of their other friends. But it wasn't like a name where you know. I mean, I wasn't. Like in this is in the eighties. I wasn't that inside. Certainly in the in, in the in the period this was going on. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I I mean, I knew George Zahorian was the steroid supplier for a lot of the WF wrestlers. I mean, before even before Vince went national. I mean, I just knew the yeah the name was the name was out to people on the inside. And you know, eventually, you know, when you know, eventually the laws changed because at that at the time in the before nineteen eighty eight, technically, um, what he was doing. Um, was not. I mean, I, I guess it's debatable if it was legal or not. I mean, there's there's different ways of looking at it. And during the trial, you know, they were looking at it in various different ways. But after 1988, it, it absolutely clearly was illegal what he was doing, and he continued to do it for a little while afterwards. And that's what he got busted for. Well, then let's put it this way: he would arrive at at the at the arena with a box, and in the box there were little bags. Now he had not examined anybody. You know what I mean? Um, it's it's not as if he examined somebody. And, um, and and there was a, a situation that they needed corrected, you know, medical. All, 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 all these guys were suffering. is low. <laughs> all these guys were suffering from an, all the all the guys were suffering from anemia. No, you know what's, you know what was actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, it was really funny and sad. It was in the closing remarks by Sean O'Shea in the McMahon trial, and he was just, you know, it, it, he actually did a tremendous closing, even though he came nowhere near getting any convictions. But that's another story. The story that trials a story in itself. But in the um, in his closing state's company, they all have an illness. They all need medicine, and they never get better. Yeah, and you know the dead giveaway that you know, that uh, everyone remember the, the long white coat he used to wear as a doctor. It was like, um at, at the matches. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, he's just drawing attention to himself. He's one of the you no. Know? Well, he, he, I mean, I remember, you know, he did angles. Oh yeah, yeah. That was the other one I always thought. Um, and this was this was from a wrestling standpoint. It's, and, it, and he was not the only one who did this. I always thought that it was really scary, whenever, because if if you look back at WWF tapes, okay, and the doctors that did angles, ultimately in in almost every case, uh. Should not have called attention to themselves because they all ended up in they all end up in trouble except for one and 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 without mentioning who the one was that didn't you know he ended up being banned from the dressing room too because they were afraid he was going to end up in trouble but he never did yeah. so and and I have to say though that you know on a human side I think it's just really sad like forever yeah and uh, he he was he was sucked in but it it wouldn't have happened well, unless he was encouraged and 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 his life really life. Oh yeah, yeah. He spent he spent years ago. The thing that was sad was he thought I think that Zahorian thought all these guys were his friends, and then the minute there was he, I mean they disassociated him from you know themselves from him. I mean you know Hogan was just like oh you know like I never saw the guy you know I mean I don't know where this picture came from, and it's like you know this picture the big picture that was in all the papers of Vince Zahorian and Hogan, and it's just like oh we get pictures taken all the time. The only reason I'm involved in this is because you know I once took a picture with this guy, and it's like you know. You know, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what I mean? I mean, especially when everything came out later that you know, I mean, you know, he was he was sending Hogan drugs, you know, through the mail. That's right. You know, to Hogan's house, to Hogan's friend's house, to Vince McMahon's office to give to Hulk Hogan. You know. That's right. I wonder how some of these guys can can sleep at night. So I have to say, I mean, it's just a very sad human commentary. But that is that is um, a lot of uh, the nature of not all pro wrestlers, but but so deep into it where the whole thing is con. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of them they don't separate the fantasy part from a lot of them don't separate the fantasy part from the reality. Um, and you know, you documented you know the stuff with Abdul and everything like that. You know, just little things. I mean, here's this guy with all this money, and he's you know trying to you know con people to save on like a hotel room or something. It was, it was amazing. I mean, I, he and I honestly don't know what he what he did that night when he had me driving around half the night. 
Um, but uh, it was just funny, uh, the, the scene when, when Flair comes into the, what was it, Ruby Tuesdays or whatever it was, it, and, uh, and, and, you know, Abby just leaves him with the drink pill. <laughs> it was just very, very Abby, you know? And he used to come in directly from Japan, and he'd have these huge wads, like, you know, 10 grand. And, and he, I don't blame him for not wanting to leave him in the dressing room. And he used to he used to you know roll it up in the in the in the old school sock you know and give it to me and because he knew I was in the middle of the ring I wasn't going to run anywhere and um, this big bulge in, in, in my tuxedo uh, pants and what people didn't know is that it like there were ten fifteen thousand dollars here <laughs> that he was just bringing back from Japan it was amazing and it made me very nervous after a while I just said to him Abby you find someplace else to, to put your money while you're working because I, I I can't risk this yeah. So. Let's go to Alan. Alan, what's going on? Hey, how's it going? Hey, wait, wait, Alan. Brian, 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 go ahead real quick. I'm just saying, imagine losing Abdul the Butcher's money. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a fork in your forehead. Okay, <laughs> hey, go ahead, Alan. Hey, how's it going? It's going good. Go Great. Pretty good. Great. Uh, Gary, the book was very interesting, and I want to ask you about some of the stories that might not have been in the book, any of the locker room fights that didn't make it into the book, besides the Anderson Vicious fight. Um, Anything transpire interesting? To tell you the truth, um, I, I was never exposed to um, the real deal fights in, in the dressing rooms. Right. Um, I really don't know that. I mean, I, I, to my knowledge, that's not a common occurrence. Right. Um, you know, every about the, you know some of the, the bar fights. Right. But um, no, you know, the, the guys are very careful around each other and right. with each other. They never, you're going to be working in the ring with somebody. Right. You don't want to be on the outs with them. Uh, right, but was there intense heat with Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair at one time? That's what I've heard for years. Yeah, I mean, it was a... Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, Dusty really, uh, really did Flair in, you know, so many times. Right. And Flair was always very, you know, rightfully resentful of it. Um, but most of these wars were wars of words uh -huh. and, uh, and not of fists. Right. You ever see any matches deviate from the script? Um, only the night that Andre the Giant fell asleep in the ring. Was that really bullish was that with, thing in 20 years? Was, was that, Gary, was that with John Studd? Uh, that was with the Iron Sheik. Hmm. Oh, okay. It was in New Jersey, North Jersey, spot show. Yeah. I think he did once with John Studd too. This was later. This was actually maybe even after you had you had left. Mm -hmm. I just remember the story of. Um, you know, he was in the ring and, and he like held Stud in a headlock, or Stud held him in a headlock, and all of a sudden he hears him snoring. And it's just like, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, Stud is like the thing about this. Stud was like a bad enough worker as it is, okay? I mean, and 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 Andre, I mean, if you know, let's face it, even if you were a good worker and Andre's asleep, what can you do? Yeah, right. I mean, could, could you imagine? I mean, like, if you, he must have panic and just, yeah, it's like, you know, so he just kind of gets, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I guess I would have put a sleeper on him. <laughs> yeah. No, but you've never seen a fight, uh, you know, break out in the ring because I know it's happened before a couple of times. But yeah, no, I, I've never, um, no, I, I've never seen seen that. Right. And also, I want to ask you, what is your opinion of Hulk Hogan as a person? I mean, you were around him. What do you? Right. Well, um, Hulk Hogan face to face is very different from Hulk Hogan when you remove yourself from being with him. And, and mm -hmm. what a master politician this guy is. Yeah. <laughs> He's kind of a oh, uh, very, very nice uh, two faced person, isn't he? Pardon me? Two-faced person, right? Um, he was always very nice to me. Okay. Um, at the time when uh, Michael Buffer had come in, um, and before I realized that Henry represented both of them, I had made the mistake of talking to Hulk about the situation, mm -hmm. and it was probably, you know, like a really bad thing mm -hmm. for me to do. <laughs> but I, I didn't know it, and you know, to my face, he would, you know, he's talking to me about, you know, I'll, you know, I'll talk to Eric and, and whatever, whatever. But you know, now in hindsight, I can see that I was just, uh, you know, uh, just probably releasing myself from WCW a little bit earlier. <laughs> um, he's, um, why can't he just hang up the, the boots? Right. You know, he's being well, selfish. It's, 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 yeah, it's what we talked about. I mean, it's so hard to walk away. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, if Hulk Hogan walks away from wrestling, like the whole world is gone. Well, he's off TV for good. Right. The whole world, because because the only reason he can make it as an wrestler, as Hulk Hogan, the former wrestler, he's you know like uh, what's the guy Fabian or something. You know, one of those guys that sort of a that sort of was once a celebrity, but nobody today even knows knows why. How many? If if all of your listeners were just to imagine 
that they would be in their 40s and never have to work another day in their life, and they can they can live in luxury and, and have their investments. Like, who would not want that? Um, it, it just shows you the mania, you know, the, the craziness of of the, psych, the the psyche of some of these guys, and most of the guys. You know, they, it's just very difficult to walk away. I, I think it's really sad for the guys that can't walk away because they can't afford it. Um, guys that have made tons of money in the business and wind up poor and, and on the welfare rolls when they're when they're through. That's well, that's really well, sad. I mean, you know, and we got we got to run to a break, but I mean, look at even let's face it, uh, Dusty Rhodes is still wrestling. Ric Flair is still wrestling. Yep. We have like a bunch of emails all asking the same question, Uh-oh. and that is, who was the guy whose name was on the list that you picked out when Ron Simmons won the title? Uh, you know what? I don't remember. The gambler. I honestly, <laughs> honestly don't remember. I'm sorry right. that I don't, but I'm just yeah. being totally honest with you. One of the one of the uh, when I when I was reading about uh, the various uh, European tours that you talked about, mm-hmm. um, there was an incident, and, and you never talked about this one. It's not the Arn Anderson seditious incident, which you did talk about, and I don't even know if you were there or remember it, but I I seem to remember that there was a fight with because uh, you wrote a lot about PN News and Curtis Hughes, and I guess they're snoring and things like that. But, there was a there was a fight I get uh, I think with PN News and Rick Rude at one point on one of the tours. Were you around then or? Um, I was probably on the tour, but I wasn't present for it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm privy to it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, just, I mean, I had just kind of heard that. Uh, Actually, PN and Curtis they could have had a fight with anyone at any second. These I mean, guys were ready to rip their throats out. Yeah. You know, they were they were just uh, anti-social human beings. Now, uh, Curtis Hughes is an, a real interesting case. Um, he and I were sitting at the uh, boarding gate waiting to go over on one of these European tours. And his disenchantment and his uh, anti-social tendencies stem back from his football days. When, when he, was, um, he went in for a tryout with the Kansas City Chiefs, I believe it was. And just like when I was breaking into wrestling, announcing, uh, I was so naive. He was very naive, too, and, and he couldn't believe that the veterans were trying to hurt him, that were trying to take him out. And, uh, you know, he was just very disgruntled from his experience there, and I think that's never left him. I mean, he's carried it with him. Um, he, he, you know, trusts no one and doesn't like too many people, and um, that's really driven him to uh, to um, really mess up a lot of, uh, of his life. That's he got... That. He got some chances because he was such a big, agile guy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when he first started, I mean, I remember for a big guy, that guy used to come off the ropes really fast. And, you know, I remember he got the bodyguard role and things like that. But he he, he blew every one of those chances. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Uh, uh, you know, it, it was a, it's a, like a self-fulfilling prophecy on his case. But it was almost from those ex- early experiences, um, he just has put blocks in, as you said, every opportunity that he's had to, to shine. Uh, let's go to James in Seattle. James, what's going on? Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going Pretty good. Good. Hey, Dave, uh, I, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for um, correcting my my uh, mail situation. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, I, I can't stand I, I can't stand the post office, but I think by saying that that was probably a stupid thing for me to say because <laughs> it's so frustrating with the post office. That's all I can say. It shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that hard to like mail things and then have them arrive like in you know three or four days. You would you would think without being like burned or having holes in them or just not arriving. Yeah. Going to the wrong address. Coming back. <laughs> coming back even. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I, I got a um, uh, a couple figure fours from a friend of mine, and his were actually burned as well. So it, it must be something with the post offices up here. Yeah, I've never heard that anywhere else. I where want to know how things get burned. It was just a hot issue. That, that's all. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Anyways, um, just, just a little comment about the um, interview on your website today. Buff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is is he an extreme case of believing his own hype or what? Uh, more than I most, think yeah. An outspoken case. I mean, to to <laughs> say that he's definitely underpaid. 
Yeah. He, I mean, I mean, like, 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 look. Okay, he hangs around with Sting, who makes way more than he does, with Luger, who makes more than he does. So he's figuring I'm running around the country and I'm underpaid, understanding that you know they're for whatever reason, or Scott, or Scott Steiner, right. you know, Rick Steiner, they they all made more money than him. Norton made more money than him, you know, which was another case. But you know, he's thinking uh, I'm underpaid, you know. So that's yeah. what he thinks. But has he ever, in his, you know, drawn any money himself? You can't tell him that. <laughs> because because they were all on all those cards in 98. And those cards, remember they, they had that, that one period where they sold out like 23 straight nights? Right. And he was, I don't even think he worked any of those shows, though. He probably just like showed up and did interviews on TV because that guy never, that guy used to not do house shows all the time. Yeah, he didn't, he have, didn't he have God, one he, of those deals where it was uh, five nights a month or something? I, that I don't know, but God, I remember that guy used to get away with no showing, like more than anyone. I mean, like, and not so much. This was one of the things about WCW that's like so wonderful about that company is that like he no showed, uh, like like ticket on sale dates and public appearances and things like that over and over again. It was just like one of those things, and and, and no one ever got in trouble for doing a discipline to anyone. So after doing that for a while, what happens is is that they never ask him to do it. So that way. It, it, like it, like the game is as well. If you if you don't go a couple times, they'll start out guys like, you know, like Rey Mysterio Jr. who won't say no and will show up. You know what I mean? So those guys end up doing all this that that kind of stuff. Or Ric Flair, who, you know, I mean, granted is like the best guy to send on some of those first days, or at least used to be, just because you know he could go to do the talk shows and he was so good at it. But um, you know, it's like the guys who didn't want to do it, they just like. You know, made it. You know, they, they, their their punishment was not having to do it, which is exactly what they didn't want to do in the first place. So you know, it's like kind of, I don't know. It's like the guys who never do jobs, who, who refuse to do jobs. Their reward is instead of being forced to do jobs, their reward is no one ever asks them to do jobs anymore because you know, no one, it, you know. Because they, I don't know. Yeah. Because yeah. Kind of like the the Scott Steiner thing where, you know, he gets physical with the uh, road agents and gets sent home with pay. Yeah, and then he comes back with a bigger. For a holiday, and then he gets back, and he comes back with a bigger push than ever. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was it. Um, thanks. To, thanks for getting that mail thing situated. I, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. And I'll keep listening and reading. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's go to Adon in Toronto. Hey, Dave. How's it going? It's going very good. Um, I have a question for you. Have any wrestlers ever been really rude to you until they realized who you were? Me? Yeah. They usually get rude after they realize. Who they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I say it's probably the, eh, it's probably more the other way. Yeah. Um, I can't really recall like someone doing like an about face. I mean, I, I sort of, I mean, there was like there was one period um, that that pops into my head. It was Manabu Nakanishi, and. And he wasn't rude. He was actually very nice, okay? And then someone said, you know, then someone said, this is Dave, you know, like, we were just talking when they were with a bunch of people, and then someone said, this is Dave Meltzer. And then all of a sudden he went to this gushing, you know, and, and like, the other people were just laughing because it was, because one of the people who was there was actually familiar with, with working in Hollywood. And, like, so he starts doing this gushing thing, and they just go, my God, this is, like, right back in Hollywood when someone finds out you're a producer. Yeah. But, um... No, I mean, I remember um, the funniest one was um, the first when I was um, in Mexico hanging around with Jushin Liger, and, and you know, they said who I was, and Jushin Liger, like, uh, how would I say, like, you know, he holds his fingers up like it's a cross, and, it, like, you know, like he would be warding off a vampire, and he goes, no, no, <laughs> like that. Yeah. So. Also, um, would you guys ever have X-Pac on the show? Um, it's, it's one of those things with the World Wrestling Federation. That thing's clear. I mean, I mean, I'd have him on for sure, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'd have, you know, any of those guys, you know, that, that they clear to do it. But right now, you know, they think that it's competition for their website, so they're not allowing, they're not allowing people on right now. Right. I and mean, maybe that, maybe that will change. What? If he were to come on, would you uh, ask him if he was on the booking committee? Well, of course I'd ask him, you know, what his influence was, of course. Yeah. Like, you can you know. get at why he never does jobs and stuff. Well, we would joke about him being so smart. Of course we would. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was just wondering, and I just wanted to thank you for the show, because some classes of mine at school are so boring, so I just go on, to, go on to the computer, stick in my headphones, and listen to the archive show from the night before. Okay. I, I'm not sure that I like encouraging you to do poorly in school, but <laughs> well, I, but I, I do take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. Hey, well, Dave. Dave. Yeah. I'm, yeah. You know, I'm thinking uh, he's asking how, how people in the business treat you. 
Mm -hmm. um, probably over the last 19 years, you have um, made the the slowest turn from heel to baby face. <laughs> but then, you know, because you think you think so? Because you. I think they still. Well, it's less now than before. They, there was a period there. Okay, there was a period there where everyone where everyone hated me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, and then there was this period where they all hated me, but nobody knew. But but it was like they were all the new crop of wrestlers who who like were taught to hate me, but they didn't know why they were taught to hate me because nobody actually explained it to them. Mm -hmm. So they hated me, but nobody knew why. And it was like they were hating me for exposing the business, except for the fact that Vince McMahon and everybody else was freely admitting what the business already was by this point in time. <laughs> so I'll tell you then. Then, then, then I think I think that where it's at right now is it just depends on like you know the, the last you know the old last match theory you know it's like if their last match was a good match they like me if their last match was a bad match they blame it on me type of thing. They they hated you. Now they 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 want to get on your show, but I'll tell you from the beginning to the end they always envied you. And that's really? a fact. Did you ever really get any death threats from wrestlers? Um. I wouldn't. I mean, I would. I would. Say, yeah, the answer is yes, but I don't think that they were serious because nobody like ever pulled a gun on me. Right. But you know, I mean, I would say in like twenty years, probably like two or three, maybe. Yeah, it wasn't that. Um, as people thought, I was never in a position where like I thought anyone was ever going to like attack me or anything like that. So did um, you reconsider what you were doing? Oh no 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 no! I mean, there were now there were there was one night where um, the AWA came to town and a couple of the AWA guys. I mean, it was like you know this this actually they were coming to San Francisco from Denver and in Denver um, they you know pretty much all vaguely knew what I looked like. This is going back. This is in, this is in the mid '80s. So this is before I'd ever probably been on television, but they vaguely knew. And a couple of the guys um, were were like you know when we were going to beat him up. I mean that's the goal, you know. And I had been warned by a couple of the other guys, and I was like this like, like this is for real. Everybody got drunk last night, and they're going to do it. So you know I, you know. I ended up in a situation where I ended up bumping into him anyway, but they, they, but what happened was, I guess, is one of the other wrestlers, you know, they asked, like, is that him? And then they go, no, 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 that's not him. And that was it. So, you know, I guess they kind of saved my life. I mean, and I, my whole thing was, like, you know, no matter what you do, avoid these guys. And then I ended up bumping into him anyway when I'm trying to avoid them. And one more question. Um, yeah. If you ever had a really good feeling that the price was going to go up, would you ever buy WWF stuff? No, me, I, I, figure, I feel that I can't. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because of the it's sort of like conflict of interest. I mean, I had I had feelings many times that the price would go up, and as it turned out, it went down. <laughs> it always went down. Every time I saw that there's going to be this artificial rise in the business, so the stock's going to go up, but then the price always went down anyway. <laughs> but I but you know no, I would never buy stock in WWF just because it's sort of a conflict of interest. And there there are times where I you know when it got down to like twelve or something, you know, it was sort of like you know this is a pretty good buy because you know it can't get any come up. You know it's it's worth so much more than than it's going for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot, and keep making shows, and I'll keep listening. Okay, thank you very much. Dave, one yes. time I was verbally assaulted because of you. Did you realize oh. that? I Did, was uh, what, they, they found a newsletter on you or something? <laughs> no, no, I, it was from a fan. I was in a convenience store looking for, for ice cream, looking for my butter pecan ice cream, and this guy, it was right when WCW started the Disney tapings, and this guy used to read your newsletter, and he used to read what was going to happen for the next three months. And he came up to me and he said, how dare you expose the business like this? You know, you're taping so far in advance and I can read all about it in Meltzer. And I just said, well, I had nothing to do with it. You know, all I do is do the announcing, you know. And he, he wouldn't go away. And finally I just said, well, if you don't want to know what's going to happen, skip that part of the newsletter. <laughs> don't read it. But you, you've caused me a few headaches, too. Now, what were your thoughts um yeah, doing in in that in that period because that was that was a pretty radical departure. Now, even in the WWF or WWF, if you went to the tapings, you sort of knew certain things that would happen ahead of time because they'd tape three four weeks ahead, you know, going way back. But when WCW's taped that many months ahead and they would foreshadow all those title changes, that was that was a depart that was a that was a big step in wrestling. I don't know if it was a good step or a bad step. Mm -hmm. Tapings were. You know, ult I mean, I mean, maybe short term they were success, but ultimately they stopped doing them and everything. Um, and they, and and you know, in today's wrestling, you couldn't do it because you can't book more than a week out because everybody, you know, nobody can keep their story straight. Right. But what were your thoughts? You know, being part of it and you know, announcing these title changes. You know, growing, you know, just growing up in wrestling, uh, where that type of stuff just was never done before. Well, you know, by that time, um, 
so much had changed that, and it had changed gradually over the time. I mean, once once Vince came out and, and started to, uh, to talk the way he was talking uh, in order to save on taxes in New Jersey, you know, before mm -hmm. the, uh, the New Jersey Congress, and saying, oh, no, no, this is a show, and uh, um, it was a gradual thing. And it, well, the difficult thing for me was to keep track of who was the champion. You know, when I was introducing guys, I had no no clue who the you know the tag team champions were at the time or who the the world champion was because you know maybe the, the straps you know were would have been dropped out of pay per view that that aired two months before what we were taping. Um, so to keep all that straight was now the, you know the thing of being a cheerleader because the people that would come in I mean we were part of the tour we were part of the Disney MGM tour and people would come in they know nothing about wrestling and we cheerleaders and tell them when to cheer and when to boo. And obviously, I believe that came across as being pretty transparently fake, you know, as far as the reaction goes. Because yeah, um, it was commotion on those shows. Oh, yeah. I mean, we had a, we had a warm-up guy. We had a comedian come in, and he would stand behind me out of the camera range, and he would tell the people when to cheer and when to boo, and he would hold signs up for them to chant certain things. It was, uh, yeah, it was just cheesy, you know? You know what's funny is, is Brian will relate to this, the... the um. The young wrestlers who who got their who were cutting their teeth at those tapings, the veterans used to just get so, um, well, I don't know, like, not mad wasn't really the word, but just going like this is so bad because these guys are out here thinking that they know what to do to get a crowd reaction, not realizing that there's these cheer and boo and chant signs, and then he, and then they would go on the road and they would be absolutely clueless as to what to do. That's right. Yep, they they had no experience in working a crowd. Yeah. Imagine trying to look nowadays with the injury rate. What? Imagine trying to nowadays with all the injuries. Yeah, with the injury rate, you could. That's what I said. With the injuries and just the fact that booking changes on a weekly basis, you you couldn't you couldn't do it. But in those days, you know, they they taped several months ahead, and there were there were embarrassing moments where you know guys would have left the company for various reasons or occasionally injuries, and um, that's you know that made those tapings kind of messed up. But today, yeah, it, it, it couldn't it couldn't be done now. We have um, I'm trying to think who it was that has uh, this is from Andrew in New Jersey who says, uh, who in the business have you remained the closest to since you left? Um, who in the business have I remained closest to? I would. There are a couple guys that that I that I have met along the way. Um, I'm still friends with the very first guy I ever introduced in the ring in July of '74. It was his very first match. Our career started at the same moment, and that's Pretty Boy Larry Sharp of the Monster Factory. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, Ace Darlin, who's a great independent wrestler, has been a buddy of mine for. Uh, over 10 years, and through him, I've met uh, Crowbar, and mm. um, he's a good buddy too. Um, you know, then Jim Kettner down in uh, Delaware, um, touch base with him once in a while, and some guys that are out of the business now, that uh, we, promoters. Um, um, you know, Dave Penzer calls me once in a while, um, but mostly guys that are no longer in the business, um, either promoters or uh, photographers, for instance, uh, different guys, but nobody currently that's on top. Just, was there ever a guy, just going back, that you thought, that you saw, like especially when you were on the road with WCW full-time, a guy who should have got a break and for whatever reasons politically never got that break? Steve Austin. No. <laughs> that's an easy one, isn't it? Yeah, right, that's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha there, Steve. <laughs> okay, Gary, Gary, we are totally out of time. Gary, I want to thank you very much. And again, it's Body Slams, Memoirs of a Wrestling Pitchman. You can get it at bodyslams.com. And uh, thank, thanks for Brian. Thanks, Al. And uh, we will be back tomorrow at 6, and we'll have Zach Arnold as our guest tomorrow.